And then we'll get started in just a minute here. I am working on trying to share my screen using a PowerPoint presentation. I don't think I, it's only working right now through this webinar jam platform, which will be fine, but it's going to take away some of the interactive pieces of it. So uh, I'm sorry if, you know, some of it might sound a little, or feel a little disjointed just because I had kind of questions and then the answer to follow. So just kind of bear with me on that. Hello, Blanca. Thank you for joining in. All right, we will get started here. Just give everybody about 30 more seconds. I am gonna see the chat open the whole time. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to just plug in a question or if you have a thought or an idea, I'm happy to, to pause during the presentation, the webinar, chat for a minute and then go back into it. You know, unlike Zoom, I can't see any of you. And I'd much rather put some faces to, to everybody's names that I see on here. And it's just kind of a funny way to present something. I'm going to try one more time on sharing, sharing the screen for this. I, it doesn't look like it's going to work. OK, we're going to use the PowerPoint the way it is. Uh, everyone can see the ready to learn about movement slide here, is that correct? Someone just give a thumbs up and then we'll get going. I wanna make sure that you can see the content. Thank you again, Blanca. All right, here we go. And this, and who's ready to learn about movement is the first slide. And this is a, it's a video of my son. I have twin boys and he's about one and a half here and he's perfectly timing to some music. And it's a funny, a funny intro of my son, Graham. Uh, but in today's webinar, we're gonna talk about two challenging concepts. It's the concept of, of how we move and the importance of movement and then how that movement relates to pain. And in the physical therapy world, I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I've been practicing for, I think, 11 years now, and I have my orthopedic clinical specialty, and I have other hand manual therapy certifications. I've, I've written a book on the subject of pain, and I've done all of this work because I'm so fascinated and so unsettled with how these two topics of biomechanics and pain relate to each other. On one hand, you know, back in the 90s, we talked about pain as this sort of bottom-up approach, or there's a peripheral problem. And then with the advancement of functional MRIs, we started seeing really more of this top-down approach of the brain sort of drives pain. And I feel like there needs to be more communication between these two worlds. Movement influences pain, and pain influences movement. So today, the objectives of this webinar are to learn how movement can help shape pain and then learn how pain can shape movement. And then using sort of our bread and butter of graded exposure, the gradual exposure to new, new stimuli to help understand how to take someone from pain to a higher level of performance. Now, this is what I'm talking about with the webinar. This is a, a, an exam question that they gave to first graders in Hong Kong. And you look at this question, and on the actual PowerPoint, you wouldn't be able to see the 87 right away. But the purpose of this question is to get you think, thinking differently about pain. When I, as you pause and look at this, so the question is, what parking spot is the car parked in? And the car is under that 87. When I first did it, I was thinking 16 minus 10 is six. Okay, there's two sixes in the first row. There's a six and an eight, and then an eight and an eight. And then... If you sort of turn your head 180 degrees or flip your computer around, you'll see that the numbers then go from left to right, 86, 87, 88, 89. And the purpose of that is pain is complex. And if we're asking the wrong questions or using the wrong framework, 
we're going to come up with the wrong answer. So my goal today is to help help everyone think about maybe how to start looking at that problem from a more holistic standpoint, how to look at it really from like a, a more well-rounded, uh, looking at the problem differently, looking at it, it's complex, but how can we simplify it sort of thing? So when we talk about pain, what we know is that it's an end of, it's always an individualized experience and it's gonna be influenced by varying degrees of biological, psychological, and social factors. Biological meaning nature. So there's like this genetic aspect to it. And then there's your environmental component. And it's how those two worlds collide combined with all your experiences that determine whether or not you're going to have pain. So good luck treating that because that's, I mean, there's so much unloaded in that. Now we, we learn the concept of pain as we, as we get older, as we have more experiences and get and test ourselves in various ways. So pain from a young age, as having three little kids now, you can see that there's many times where a young child doesn't know what the emotion should be. Something hurts hurts him or her, but then they don't know how to respond to it. And that's because pain's this learned concept. One way that I try to simplify it is that at the end of the day, pain is simply a stressor on the body. If you look at the areas of the brain that light up in a functional MRI with stress, and you take those same areas in pain, Pain is a form of stress on the body. Knowing that, we know that when stress occurs, there's this autonomic nervous system response. The same thing is going to occur when someone has a pain response. So we need to tap into the autonomic nervous system part of how to get their nervous system to calm down so we can address the pain appropriately. So I have twin boys, as I said a minute ago. We have Graham on the left and August on the right. And the two of them have been, they're fraternal. If you can't tell, they look nothing alike. Uh, and when you look at them, Graham is a lot stronger mover. So he has strong mechanics. He can hang from the monkey bars. He can throw, run. Um, August, on the other hand, he, from birth, he's been a much weaker mover. He was in the NICU because his diaphragm didn't work as well. That pump reflex. He was always spitting up his food. And that sort of has led him into having a weaker core and he's more uncoordinated now. As a result of that, Graham has less falls, he's less clumsy, he gets injured less. August, well, he falls all the time. He's sort of like our needing a Band-Aid all the time child and he's very injury prone. He'll turn around, he'll find a crack to fall on. And so who has more pain in this situation? Well, because pain is so complex, one, they have these moments of pain, but they don't have enough environment and context to really have pain. But Graham is way less injury prone. So his physical structure is much better. But August, when he gets injured, he can get back up so much faster. Graham cut his foot the other day, uh, scootering, and he held on to the pain of that for so much longer than August would. So I always say we need to find this middle ground of minimizing the physical risk of injury, which is Graham, strong mechanics. And then we need to maximize that with grit or strong mental resiliency to problem solve and figure out pain. And fortunately, as PTs and movement professionals, we can do this through the platform of movement and exercise. We can teach someone physical resiliency so we can make them stronger, give them more mobility, give them better balance, help their proprioception. But at the same time, we can educate them on how their psychological and emotional, their environmental state is playing into their pain. What I often tell my patients is that we need to teach them to become their own detectives. And what that means is we need to teach them what are the things in their life that are driving their pain? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Are they doing an exercise routine that's increasing their symptoms? Or maybe exercise is the thing that really decreases symptoms. Uh, what is their work postures like? So when they're working right now, um, if you're sitting at the desk and you're really slouched, well, we know slouching by itself doesn't cause pain, but if you're there for eight hours a day, your tissues stiffen into that work posture. Your posture is at home right now. At the end of the day, my wife will lay in bed with her phone and sort of slouch into that for a long period of time. Or she'll say her fingers start to go a little bit numb after a bit. Those are signals from the body that are, and she's also having some neck tension. And it's not a surprise because the positions that we put ourselves in 
and sort of the stress that we hold in those positions are going to be determinant of whether or not or they're going to be components of whether or not you have pain. Other factors like sleep and nutrition, which I'll personally get into in a little bit. One's time of day is super important. Do, do they feel more pain in the morning and then loosen up in the afternoon? Or is pain more aggravated by more movement throughout the day? How does temperature impact pain? Is it hot or cold outside is going to tell you the nervous system's role of the pain. A level of stress, work balance, and then their overall happiness. One's state of being and how they approach a problem will really, what's their sort of grit factor and their level of excitement to put up with the problem. If your immediate response is to be fearful and shy away, well, you're probably not going to handle that problem as well. In the clinic, I tell my patients that, especially the ones with chronic pain, that understanding pain and getting out of pain is like riding a roller coaster or playing with a yo-yo. There's going to be moments where you feel like you're on top of it, and then you're going to push it a little bit too much, and then you might feel like you go down a hill. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be things that make it better and worse. And sort of on this detective idea, it's helping them figure out what's driving the pain and making that better and worse is where we can take it from this sort of big unknown and then sort of gradually figure out, hone down the pattern of what's causing symptoms. When we know that, that there's a pattern that's under, underlying it and driving it, then we can just start to pick away at that pattern and solve how, why someone's having pain. In the clinic, again, with more of my chronic pain people, I'll use a overall quality of life scale. And the main factors that I'm looking at, the big five that I call them, are one's sleep, one's nutrition, so quality of sleep, quality of food, their relationships, so that's going to be their community, their stress management, and then their movement or their fitness health. And those big five fill most of the buckets of why someone might have pain. When they're coming to see you for a movement-related problem, we need to start from that. We need to use movement as sort of the initial mold tissue to then build on all those other things. Because that's how we sort of work into, well, how are you sleeping? How's your nutrition? And again, in a minute, I'm going to talk about why those are actually important. Because we say these things as clinicians, oh, how are you sleeping? Oh, not so good. Well, we need to work on that. But like, how do we do that? And what does that actually mean? And that's what we're going to cover today. So pain, it's an individualized experience and it's subjective to the person. So I thought one of the best ways to talk about pain would be to use some of my own experiences and then tell you how I've dealt with some pain on and off and then how I really have, have solved that problem, tying in those key elements we just talked about. So in 2011, I was diagnosed with a venous, uh, with a blood clot, a four inch blood clot in my subclavian vein. I can show you the scar here. And I woke up one day my right arm was about twice as big as my left arm and it was blue and purple and I knew something wasn't right. Initially, I, I was going through my first semester of PT school and initially I thought that I had an infection. And so, cause I had some scrapes and bruises on my elbow. It turns out that I had a blood clot. So quickly after I have a first rib resection for venous thoracic outlet syndrome and they do a vein graft. That means the hospital that I was at they took my subclavian vein, they measured it up in a vein bank that the hospital had and used a cadaveric vein to put it in there. Now, the vein graft didn't work, so they, they, would always, they would do these Dopplers to see the status of the vein. The vein closed off, so I kind of was back at square one in some areas of I didn't have a clot anymore, but I'm now missing the main vein that goes back to my heart. Um, typical to how most people would, I did four to six months of your standard rehab and then I was having still some, I was definitely having some problems or trying to figure out the situation because the doctor, they viewed it as they're taking out the rib, they are solving the problem. I'm having to deal with all the consequences that follow that problem. Now, fast forward 2011 to 2017, as I'm training more and I'm getting back into life and fitness, there is, I'm starting to notice changes in my body. First of all, this connection of the first rib to the clavicle. And if you look at the top two pictures here, the first rib and the clavicle, they sort of butt up against each other. So if here's my sternum, they match there right in the middle. And here's my clavicle, here's my first rib. Well, if they take out the first rib, that clavicle and the SC joint now has way more play and way more room. So what I'm noticing as I'm doing lat pull down, 
I'm starting to have a grinding feeling in my SC joint. As I'm doing bench press, I feel a lot of pressure. You know, as from a joint mechanic standpoint, the roll and glide, the SC joint is getting pulled forward under less resistance. So I'm noticing these SC joint arthritic changes. You can't see it on the video, but I mean, maybe you can a little bit. But right here, this SC joint is so much more prominent. Now, it doesn't mean I'm having pain, but it means that there's something going on that's causing more mechanical stress across that area. Another thing that they kind of don't tell you is that they're getting rid of, they take out your first rib, but they also remove the anterior middle scaling. So the right shoulder depresses, is more depressed now. We view the, the muscles as often as contract and relax, but the muscles have a very important function for holding, just holding position. Now my right shoulder without the anterior middle scaling naturally drops down a bit more. So if you look at my posture from the front, you'll see that the right side is about an inch and a half lower than the left. That just puts more strain across the brachial plexus and across the region there. And so that from a starting point is putting my system under more tension. Because of that, whether it's vascular or neuro neurogenic, my right hand would get colder. And then because of the collateral issues, I would have intermittent swelling in that right arm with exercise. What I often tell patients with that is that my main highway, the subclavian vein has closed off. So all my collateral circulation needs to pick up that slack. As I've gone on through the years, that's gotten better and better where I hardly know, notice any of that intermittent swelling anymore. I've, and then the last part is I would always have to be doing this regular maintenance to work on my scap. So because that position was down further, I would be strengthening mainly overhead my, my elevators. I'd be working on position of retraction. I was basically doing all those things as constant work to try to avoid not having extra mechanical pain in that area. Now let's fast forward to mid 2017. And that's where I start noticing this itchiness that would develop right in my elbow. And it would happen to me, it would wake me up in the middle of the night. Itchiness is a confusing thing because it's, is it something that's going on on the skin level or is it the nervous system problem? Well, then I would press into my right upper trap and that would send this nervy response with increased itchiness in the elbow. So then all of a sudden I'm, I know that the, the itchiness is related to the nervous system issue. And also from a nerve tension standpoint, I could feel nerve tension go down the entire radial nerve, even into the back of the thumb. It's a vague report of pain, but it's something that I would consistently notice. So ibuprofen would help um, if I, because it, it would probably take away some pain and inflammation. If I would traction here with the upper trap and press in there, I would get this cervicogenic headache type of symptom of a referral up into my head. So as I'm diagnosing this myself, I'm thinking the nervous system's involved, obviously, and then I'm trying to see what other factors are at play. If I would do scapular elevation, as I said, that would unload that area because I'm hanging down more. So that would help them alleviate symptoms. And then deadlifting and pulling movement. So deadlifting here, that heavy deadlift especially would draw that down more. And that would often cause symptoms because it's this big pulling action across the front of the shoulder, almost pulling it into a further depressed position. And then lastly, as you can see in the picture, probably because of a combination of life factors and then also mechanical stuff, I would, I developed so much tension in my upper middle back. You can almost like see that area of stiffness there. And that would cause when I would drop my head down, I would feel this neural tension all the way down to my low back. I knew these things weren't right. It was, it was painful, but that pain would really hurt me at night more. And there was something confusing about that. Now, at the same time here in 2017, I started my own business. I was about to have my first child. I had a very active lifestyle, but I was still having all this pain and tension. I would stay up late at night working. And so that means I was sleeping less. So I was on the computer for probably four hours a night after the workday, getting less than five hours of sleep. That would be augmented by drinking caffeine. And then the body has this natural response at around 10 p.m. to want to eat more. So I was doing all these other lifestyle things that are likely feeding into my pain, but I didn't fully know how at this point. So what's driving the pain? Well, it, it follows the radial nerve pathway. So I'm thinking about the problem as something from C6 to C8, and then the posterior cord, the radial nerve drives through the armpit, down the radial tunnel, goes 
into here. So right where I was having that itching is where that nerve pathway goes. And then it extends into the back of the hand, primarily the thumb and these two fingers. So I knew that there was this radial nerve component as I delved into itchiness more, itchiness is a response of the nervous system. So similar to how someone has more pain if they put pressure or vibration or temperature change in an area, itchiness is simply a sensory response from the nervous system. So, and then I'm thinking there has to be a, an inflammatory component because of, it feels warm and hot and then ibuprofen helps draw away those symptoms. Lastly, there's this piece of sleep and nutrition that it's waking me up at night and then I'm eating late. So I know that those are, are playing a role. I just don't know how yet. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. So how do we address this problem? Well, I, I kind of bucketed it as there's three main drivers of the pain. There's the mechanical aspect, there's the sleep piece, and then there's the lifestyle piece, the work, work and stress related stuff. On the mechanical component, I needed to strengthen my deep core as these are all, these things all had to happen sort of together. I don't view these as I had to strengthen the core sometime and this, this then. The body moves and is used as a system. So I needed to strengthen the entire system. With the deep core perspective, my upper abs were stronger than the lower core, my deep core. So I was getting pulled down into this position. Strong rectus abdominis pulls you into thoracic flexion and that limits or changes how the shoulder girdle can move. So I did a, you know, a lot of plank type of movements, dead bug, really focusing on drawing in the deep core, that in and up action to hold position there where it's all transverse and obliques and less rectus. Those are the type of deep core things that I was focusing on. Next, I had to strengthen the scapular stabilizers, primarily the traps and the serratus. My right side, as I was saying, is depressed and then it rolls often anterior and that's a combination of gravity and then muscle weakness and then the lack the change of anatomy so i would do a lot of overhead shrugging type exercises to bring that shoulder up and i know that is a, a counterintuitive perspective because we often say down and back is sort of the cue for scapular strength but you need to look at the whole picture down and back would increase symptoms it would almost mimic that deadlift sort of pulling pain so on the serratus anterior side, because I was weak and I was getting pulled forward, as, as the thoracic spine drops forward, my scapula would get pulled into an anterior tilt. The serratus anterior hugs that back. My pecs were getting tighter. My low trap and mid trap were getting weaker. So my upper thoracic spine was just getting pulled forward. Strengthening the serratus anterior hugs that back into place and gives the scapula a better resting position. It gave my, my rotator cuff and my shoulder a position to actually hold from. And so strengthening the traps and serratus were super important to taking away the mechanical pressure of the pain. Next, I needed to strengthen the thoracic spine. I told you earlier that deadlifting was often causing symptoms because of the pulling part. Well, my thoracic spine, as I would get into a heavy deadlift, would drop that way, and I wasn't able to hold that thoracic extension. So strengthening thoracic extension while keeping the uh, scapula in a good position was extremely important. The other way I would really work on that was a goblet squat or a kettlebell front squat. And the reason that is when you have the weight here, it forces your chest to maintain more of an upright position and it counterbalances the weight. So I would strengthen the thoracic spine in different ranges of the squat. Then I would have to mobilize the low cervical spine extension and rotation specifically, as you saw back a few slides ago, there was so much tension in that upper thoracic area that that would draw my shoulders forward. And you should try this right now at home where really let the shoulders drop forward and then try to turn your head and neck. What happens is the shoulders get pulled forward, that tightens and stiffens the muscles on the front of the neck, it pulls the upper trap forward, that puts tension where the upper trap connects onto the spine, and limits mobility. So as you're trying to look into rotation or go back into extension, if you're doing that from a position of the thoracic spine being pulled forward, you're sort of creating your own new early end range. And the way to work on that is to get the, the chest up, core in, and then practice mobility from a taller position. Otherwise, you're going to be, you're creating your own block basically. Here, I, I can't move any further. If I go back, then my head has another 15 degrees to rotate. 
I would work on it like that. And then I would work on it by arching back through the spine that way. And that would get that upper cerv our lower cervical, upper thoracic area moving significantly more. Lastly, or sort of encompassing all of this, is that whenever I would look down, I would feel significant neural tension down my entire spine. So through a gradual cat-cow spine mobility, other spinal mobility twists and things, I needed to address that spinal nerve tension. So we talked about the mechanical piece. The other driver of the pain was sleep. Now you don't, I always tell my patients that if you're not sleeping, you're probably not healing. And I didn't know sleep was a factor, so I needed to start tracking it. There's a whole bunch of different ways you can track it using an Apple Watch or something like that. I started using this Aura Ring, which I thought was pretty, pretty fun, and it gave me really good information. And on the left-hand side, that's when I wasn't sleeping as well. The things that you can see are that my resting heart rate was much higher than when I'm sleeping better. My heart rate variability, which I'm, I would highly recommend looking into heart rate variability if you don't know much about it, but that is your measure, your internal level of stress. So it looks at your autonomic nervous system and at how it is tolerating stress. So it doesn't matter if I worked out hard yesterday or I had a lot of work stress yesterday, that all funnels back to this heart rate variability number. Ironically, you want heart rate variability to be closer to 100. So like this 80 number is significantly better than 29. Studies looking at HRV have found that if like the lower your HRV is, the higher risk of mortality that you have. So the things that I cared most about was that every night when I was sleep deprived, my heart rate was 11 beats a minute faster per minute. And then my heart rate variability was just plummeting at that same time. This is important because if you're not if your nervous system isn't calming down when you're sleeping, so I said earlier, pain is, is a stress response. It's a response of the autonomic nervous system. If you're not addressing that, if you're, if you're having to work hard, you're under a lot of stress while you're sleeping because your heart rate's higher, then that means you're not healing. So you have to be, you have to be sleeping for your body to be recovering. That's when that mechanism happens. When I look at that, so I started tracking my sleep and I realized how poor my sleep habits were because I could see the, the difference of it. I, would, I was minimizing my late night snacks and having less caffeine in the evening. Caffeine ramps up your sympathetic nervous system. I needed to pull back from that because it was, it was a component that was not allowing me to sleep, which was not allowing me to heal. At the same time, I needed to minimize eating later in the evening. If I would eat late at night, literally the sleep ring would say, your heart rate lowered later than normal last night. And that's not gonna, that doesn't allow you to get into deep sleep, which doesn't allow your body to heal. And so I had to minimize those factors and become aware of them. Then I needed to start following a regular bedtime routine. Sometimes I'd go to bed at 1130. Sometimes it would be 130. There was no consistency. And that would then lead to this other, these other sleep related issues. And I'm a great sleeper. I don't have sleeping problems, but I just need to get my butt in bed basically and do that. And then lastly, I needed to address the late night computer work, all the screen time, all the prolonged posturing. It was just driving my nervous system and not allowing it to start dropping into that parasympathetic sleep state. If you're not sold on that yet, I want to talk about the connection of pain and sleep more from a neuroscience standpoint, and then briefly discuss the how sleep works in relation to pain. So we now know that from the pain matrix, when you take a I get a functional MRI done, there's a whole bunch of areas that light up in the brain. When you sleep, other similar areas also happen to light up. And so when you're sleep deprived, that changes your frontal lobe's ability to make decisions and to problem solve. It increases your reactivity to stimuli. So let's say you're having an ankle sprain and you're underslept, your, your protective jump away response is gonna be significantly faster because you can't analyze that problem accordingly. And then lastly, your amygdala, which is your emotional regulation, will increase as well. So you're gonna likely be more fearful and other negative emotions associated with pain are gonna be kind of on their edge, ready to go. From a sleep standpoint, when you, we have two, we go through cycles of sleep every night. We go from REM sleep into non-REM sleep. And we repeat that for four to six cycles every night. Each one lasts, I think 80 to hundred minutes. 
if we're getting eight hours of sleep, we'll go through those four to six cycles. You have to have non-REM sleep to get into REM sleep. It's like one is your ticket to the other. So during non-REM sleep, which is in the first part of the, of the stage, your blood flow and oxygen is pumping your muscles and that helps with tissue repair and tissue growth. During REM sleep, your muscles start to relax and that allows you to take to pull tension away and that reduces some of the symptoms that are associated with pain. So we're seeing not only from a cortical level, but also this body standpoint, how important the relationship of sleep is to pain. And I, again, it's, it's not that mine was purely mechanical. It's not that it was purely sleep, but addressing these, these components together significantly reduced the pain. And then lastly, I had to address the lifestyle component. I, I viewed it as on a general level, I needed to slow down. Everything I was doing from caffeine to meals late at night to help get my glucose up, those were all just revving and ramping my nervous system. I was trying to basically overcome the problem with stimulants and stuff like that. When you do that, when you're working that much and you're underslept, you're, you're not consistently hitting other routines like a balanced workout routine. So I created a balanced workout routine for myself, which I now share with many of my patients of weight training once or twice a week. I do flexibility type stuff once or twice a week, hit training to sort of hit that uh, carry over between cardio and anaerobic. And then every day I'm making sure that I'm moving. Also, I started incorporating things like some cold showers because that's really, really beneficial from a hormonal anti-inflammatory standpoint. I started doing this Wim Hof breathing, which is great for, for autonomic nervous system balance. Uh, maintaining homeostasis of that system. And then I made sure that I was hitting those everyday whole movements of squatting, hanging from a pull-up bar, keeping my body moving in these very functional, very dynamic ways. So to get out of pain was really a three-pronged problem. I, I had to address more than that physical component, which is often what PTs, PTs look at. Now that component is extremely important. So I'm not downplaying that at all. But without addressing the stress lifestyle part and then my and then improving the sleep, I would have only been hitting a partial pillar there. And so each factor would help somewhat, but combining all three of those factors is what may help get rid of or solve the problem. And I no longer have this problem at all. And that's something people often worry. Uh, they get rid of pain for a little bit, but they don't know if it's going to come back. And the reason they don't know if it's going to come back is because they haven't identified the problem. They haven't identified the pattern and they haven't spent enough time being their own detective around that. If you look at sort of the modern neuroscience education around how pain works, journaling and reflection is one of those things that they always tell you to do. And it's for this, this reason of observation and self-awareness that helps you understand really those factors that are triggering symptoms. So some lessons I learned along the way, graded exposure is key. I, I know that when, when I was deadlifting and I was deadlifting way too heavy, that was surefire to cause my nerve pain and itchiness at night. As, as the expression, I would say you need to walk before you can run. Now that actually makes sense because you, need, you can't just get up and start running and watching my, my young kids. You have to build the foundation of reciprocal left-right patterning before you can at a more coordinated and more velocity induced motion. How I work on this in the clinic with people is that we need to start with low nervous system input and then gradually get into higher nervous system input. So initially we're addressing pain and symptom management. From there, we kind of do our PT corrected exercises, stability, building the fundamentals. Uh, then on that, once we have stability, good range of motion back, then we can start adding some capacity of strength and then endurance to it. Lastly, once that's there, then we can start hitting those factors at a higher speed. So looking at power, plyometrics, that anaerobic capacity component. And this is the paradigm that I try to follow with anyone who comes in with pain and then work. Sometimes it goes faster than others based on how chronic their symptoms are. But this is what I'm looking at to try to get someone to the highest level of performance or have them achieve their goals. We need to move more often and we need to move better. So what I have learned and what I've seen time and again is that there's no best posture, but some postures are stronger than others. There's no bad movements, but some movements are less stable than others. An example of that would be is 
uh, so when someone goes into knee valgus when they squat, it doesn't mean that they're going to have pain right away. But when you go into that knee valgus positioning, as I drop down and my knees come in, that decreases the amount of space available in my hips. It takes away the mechanical advantage in my glutes. And so it, and then it forces other things to take on more stress and strain. It doesn't mean you're going to have pain right away, but is there a better pattern that you can use to minimize stress on your whole system? Well, most likely. And so what I say is that we need to use the most efficient movement strategies to minimize the energy expenditure on the system. How I talk about this with patients is that the body is a complex system of levers. Our bones, our skeletal structure creates a rigid framework for how our muscles can pull from. Our joints act as the pivot points. Our muscles then generate force and, and then allow for movement. And our tendons sort of buffer the, the force between the muscle contraction and then the pull of the bone, which allows movement to occur. We should use these built-in levers and pulleys because if you have poor technique, that's going to allow for poor energy transfer, which is going to overall lead to decreased health and fitness. If someone's doing their bicep curls and they're really drawn forward like this, well, here changes the mechanical advantage of the bicep. So we're no longer setting our shoulder blade position. We're not really using the bicep to its fullest capacity because we're taking it from a set shoulder position. So the mechanics and how, how you put yourself in a good starting position is going to lead to better force transfer, which is going to lead to less strain through the joints. And it's those sort of subtle changes in body position that impact how your body adapts, how it responds to loads and stress. And then, so when we talk about mechanical advantage, it's using that lever system to decrease the workload on the tissues to prevent things like tendonitis and rotator cuff strains. Another way that I look at the body is that from a evolutionary sort of design standpoint, if you think about your extremities, your upper and lower extremity, we have one main top bone. So we have one bone here, two bones here, and then a whole bunch of bones down there. So it follows a one, two, three, four, five pattern for both the upper and lower extremities. And what that means is that we have one bone here because that connects back to all the biggest muscles. These are our power and our uh, maintaining position sort of muscles. Then we start having more joints for more movement. So we have more joints, longer tendons that have a different capacity than what the shoulder girdle does. Um, we have so much more here because that's more dexterity, prehensile grasp, and that sort of thing. And the same thing works true for the foot. And when we start thinking about the body as this uh, set up stronger, more proximally, and then more mobility distally, then we start training the body differently to handle those sort of things. If someone, when they're, if you see someone come in with outer elbow pain, like an elbow tendonitis, and you notice that they're when they're doing shoulder external rotation, it's all coming from the wrist and hand. Well, they're trying to use, we need to stabilize with shoulder external rotation, but that's all coming from the elbow. That's gonna be way too much workload going through these long tendons versus bigger muscle groups. And that's where understanding how the body is connected and designed is very important. And then lastly, uh, lessons along the way, simplify the problem. So. My, my big five, as I said, if we can eat well, get sleep, move, minimize stress, and, and uh, get involved or have some community support around that, that is the healthy way to understand how to get out of pain. All right. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed that. that. That was my take on the connection of how pain and movement works and how it's related back to my life. I want to spend the next maybe 15 or 20 minutes just addressing questions and talking. You can put them in the comment box um, and then we can talk from there. And then before we get into that too, uh, Brian Schwabe and I with the TSPT have recently put out our TSPT Academy. And if anyone's interested, we I have nine plus courses on there where we talk about sports and orthopedics. Um, and if you want to, I can put the, I'll put the link in the comment box and you can check that out if you're interested but use the promo code MOVE20 and you'll get 20% off that way. Oh, thank you for the comment. Tiffany, where are you doing your residency at?
you know, some of you might be typing, but I'd love to hear your thoughts and questions. Oh, great. I did mine uh, down in Texas through the Harris Health System. And I highly recommend residencies to, to any, well, any PT, but especially new graduates who, who are worried about that money piece. I just think you forget about that so quickly afterwards and the benefit you get is, is huge. As I was saying a second ago, if you have uh, questions or case study examples of your own or thoughts, Yes, I will. Afterwards, I will put this video up on YouTube and then I will send out the link to anyone who registered for the webinar so they can watch the whole thing. Question from Gina says, I have a patient who had a proximal third right clavicle removed, has headaches and difficulty with using the shoulder. Do you have any thoughts on improving mechanics with this dysfunction? I definitely do, and and uh, I don't want to simplify it too much, but it, it seems kind of let's see, proximal third on the right. Do you know why they? So they essentially removed his SC joint. Is that what you're saying? Gina. Basically, yeah, okay. And, and that's like, it's a confusing surgery because you're kind of wondering, was there that much arthritis there? Was there something else going on they needed to do that? Ah, okay. So she had an infection that caused that. Now, what I think about is that the SC joint is your only connect, it's the only joint connection from your axial skeleton to the appendicular skeleton. So yeah, okay. That makes more sense. Uh, what I would say is similar to myself, we know that we're going to have that loss of stability, you know, that connection back here, but we still have everything that we can leverage from the backside. So scapular strengthening and really focusing on in a similar way too. I bet she's going to have some, some muscle length tension relationship issues. So doing scapular strengthening and making sure that it's not just coming from the upper trap, because most likely if, if that part is missing, She's going to be hanging down more. And then so as she goes into scapular stuff, it's going to it'll probably want to be all driven from that upper trap and levator. We need to teach her to keep the shoulder down and get that movement a lot more back through here. I often cue it as drawing the shoulders down first, turning the thumbs up, because turning the thumbs up is going to help turn external rotation and take tension off the upper traps. And that'll allow the the lower and middle trap to help stabilize position. Um, in a similar way too, I would make sure that she can use her serratus anterior and is not just using the pec muscles for everything. Oftentimes those people, well, this will kind of get pulled forward and it gets more tight through here. The counterbalance or the counter sling to that is gonna be your serratus anterior, which pulls the shoulder back into position. I know those are very similar to what I had to do, but I think in some way, She's she has a similar problem because I I lost some stability there. Well, she lost all position of it basically. And then I would start with like your more isometric holding. Yeah, okay, great. I would I would start with more isometric positional holding of things. So making sure that she can stabilize here, stabilize here, stabilize up there and then sort of work on doing more dynamic and more isotonic or more complex movements later on. But it's like, can she hold positions initially? And then can she use more function from those positions at some point? Uh, any other, I hope that answers your question, Gina. And thank you for asking. You know, the other thing that really helped me too was because the anatomy and the muscular has changed quite a bit, she probably has a bunch of, of tension and trigger points in those muscles. So for myself included, doing different soft tissue work around that area followed up with mobility and strength was, was key. 
oftentimes I had so much tension there that just trying to strengthen it, it was like I was kind of pulling against other muscles. But if you can loosen up the tension initially, so calm down the nervous system response first, then add in strength, that that would be a beneficial way to tackle the problem without increasing symptoms. Any other questions? I really appreciate it. There was, I, I think at the high, there was 25 people or so on, on the call. So I really appreciate everyone jumping on. And as I mentioned, I will, I'll send the link if you want to watch it again later or share it with a friend, I'll send everyone uh, an email link that contains the entire video. Uh, any other kind of professional development questions? Um, questions about pain? How common are lateral elbows? John asked, how common are lateral elbow conditions other than epicondylitis? Can it take months to heal? A 67-year-old, very persistent pain. I, I find elbow pain to be so tricky because of we. my approach is we have to strengthen proximally and take pressure off the common nerve roots that are running through that area too. So like with myself, that lateral elbow pain was really more of a radial nerve issue. And it didn't flare... You know, like if it's epicondylitis, it's going to have that bony pinpoint tenderness on the common tendon insertion. So in the differential diagnosis, I would, I would look to see if it's tender with resisted extension or if there is a nerve related component, it could be a mobility. If a 67 year old, um, if it's like, sometimes there can just be so much tension in that area from, from using those muscles constantly that. Uh, that just restricts mobility. I, I've never done laser treatment before for that, so I can't specifically speak to other treatments. I do, I would personally, you know, based on their pattern of pain and symptoms, I would probably dry needle the radial nerve line. I would make sure that up at C6 to C8 in that same area is moving well through here. And in a 67 year old, they're probably going to have that kind of classic lack of rotation and side bending. But I always view it as what is, what's the connected chain of symptoms. So um, how does this area influence what's happening at the shoulder and through the cervical spine or CT junction? But I would, I would try dry needling as an option. And then I would really think about about posterior shoulder strengthening and scapular position to help offload the strain that the elbow is taking on. But I'll be the first to admit, treating chronic tendonitis is just a bear because it, it often does seem to take a long time. I found decent results from like offloading it with one of those compressive braces. Um, and then as much wrist and hand is kind of keeping mobility through the fingers and through the wrist as often as possible throughout the day. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions? And I know some people might be clinicians already, other people are students. So we're kind of all approaching this from different standpoints. Uh, any recommendations for SI joint pain? When someone comes, for myself, when someone comes in with SI joint issues, I'm always looking at the above and below segment. So I wanna see how, how that L4, L5, L5, S1 segments are working. And then I wanna see uh, how well the hip joint is moving. Oftentimes when, when I see someone with SI issues, when they go into like hip flexion, that'll be more of like a hip hike position where it, it loads to the SI joint more. There's, uh, if they have pain while walking or running or going upstairs, 
those movements are split stance postures of the pelvis. So like when you walk, there's this reciprocal back and forth movement through the limbs and the pelvis. So I view that as a, as a core stability thing that needs to slow down those forces through there. Um, and then I want to make sure, and this is, you're going to be like, yeah, this is the most obvious thing, but if they're lacking good hip flexion mobility, they're probably lacking the ability to really turn on the low glute, almost hamstring attachment area. And so I need to, I'm always trying to get people to drive movement, like from, from the low glutes and the low hip, um, instead of where people often push off or they kind of, as they kick back, it'll hike and then put more tension through here. I'm thinking about how can I hold the core position and really use kind of lower down in the glute. So I think about those controlled bridge positions, deep core, low core strengthening, and then addressing through that the the side to side pelvic positions through kind of different oblique training as well. Um, you know, I know I just said a lot, but I would also think about, I would look at their cardinal plane motion and then see what motions of the lumbar spine recreate there, or if any of them recreate their symptoms. Oftentimes people will, that side drop pain can be associated with kind of just getting compressed there because the lumbar spine doesn't really open up. It sort of just collapses down into that position. So I really want to make sure that low lumbar spine is moving well. So the SI joint isn't taking on that, on that strain. I hope that wasn't just a lot without saying anything sort of comment there because it is a lot of standard things. I think in another webinar, I want to do other movement examples and just talk about things from a patterning standpoint, if anyone would be interested in that. Well, I will stay on for, for another few minutes and then we can chat if any other questions come up. Thank you, Tiffany and John. Thanks, Gina. Great. I will, I'll try to, you know, that's like what I wanted to talk about today. And then the moment we start talking about pain in relation to movement patterns, everything seems to get more complicated. I, I made three or four iterations of this PowerPoint. And then every time I came back to the complexity of pain part, and I wouldn't be able to describe that in a movement pattern issue. So then I thought the best way today would be to, to do it through the experience of myself, because I I could understand the whole biopsychosocial part and how I was able to get out of it and through kind of the lens of hopefully helping you with your patients. But I, you know, where my, I definitely believe there's a most efficient and best way to move at the same time. And I would love to do a, another webinar on movement patterns because I, I, I do a ton of work kind of around the fascial system and understanding the chains of movement and how that impacts the forces that go through the body, which impacts uh, which is a mechanical driver of pain. So I would love to talk about that. I'll plan on doing, I'll start working on that soon. All right, I'll give everybody 30 seconds more or so. Any final questions, I'm happy. You can always email me at studentphysicaltherapist at gmail.com just with questions that are maybe the things that you didn't get to today. I wish I could see everybody. That would make it more engaging for me. How do I structure learning with having a full-time job? Oh, well, kind of as you saw today, I would spend... Thank you so much, Ike. Um, I would 
shift and then the more passive values are so I'm gonna I'll answer Tiffany's question real quick and then John I'll I'll talk to that in just a second too. What what I found for myself was that I I wasn't liking all the answers that I was getting. You're welcome. Thank you, Blanca. Uh, I, I wasn't liking the answers that I was getting in the clinic. I was still seeing positive results, but I almost never knew if those were just because of time, like time was getting those people better. And I would have some people that were coming back and they were feeling flared up after sessions and things like that. And so I wasn't happy with that. So I, the way I would structure my learning is I would take a few patients that you currently have and then really delve into their, like if they're not getting better, especially consider why they aren't getting better and then start researching from there. Because I would take my hardest people and I would look at what all the best, thank you, look at all what all the best evidence says. And then so I'd really start researching these kind of niches around what people were having. And then that led me into looking at the movement system as a whole more. And then got me interested in exploring how the fascial system works. And on top of all this, it's sort of this uh, medical model of pain that we're having to manage. So I was looking at things from, I'm not really satisfied with my answers. And here's what the current evidence says. Well, what's like, what's happening in that gray space in between? But I would structure that as uh, find a few magazines or a few uh, blog people that you like to follow a lot and just start, it's, it's sort of in that, I think how you become an expert at something is that you need to you need to put in more time and more hours for for true mastery of something. And I I started putting those hours in just after work, you know, which also sort of led to some of the stuff we talked about today. So, but I would say find a few people that podcast that you really enjoy that will promote your learning, a few articles that are well reviewed and that you can read sort of what the newest evidence is coming out. And then also most importantly for me is I have my, one of my best buddies out here is a PT down in Denver. And he, I will take all my learning concepts and then use him as my soundboard. And he'll often be like, uh, you need to back up a notch. You need to explore this a little bit more. So having a few different peers that you can talk with is extremely important. Okay, and then uh, the more passive therapies, I think ultrasound and and tens and stem are still used in your more in your more corporate setting. Well, I don't use those like as a passive therapy. I'll use the massage gun a lot. I've kind of had back and forth. I those the passive therapies haven't been shown to work from an evidence state evidence based standpoint. But if someone is coming in and they're more flared up because pain is a is a stress on the system my first line of treatment is figuring out how I can calm down their level of stress. Um, and and, you know, I've, and so now people are using combo ultrasound and STEM with, uh, with dry needling too, that I've heard good results from, but I'll often use it if they are more flared up then those passive modalities are beneficial almost to bridge the gap to being able to do more active stuff. I personally will use We'll use a, a massage gun. I'll use some cupping in the fl in flared up states. Thanks, Gina. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I agree with that. It's what we're always trying to do is combine sort of the art of working with the individual with the science of working with, um, you know, like what does the science say? And the tough part is, is that pain is individualized and complex and it's multifactorial and research tries to hone in on one variable and see if that works. So I'm a big fan of using things at certain times and then sort of molding that as the person is getting better. It's much easier to do. I'm a private practice owner too and, and more of a cash-based one-on-one setting. That model is way easier to implement when, when I can spend an hour with each person. When I worked at Concentra before, I was seeing four people at a time. And unfortunately, people are, are just getting treatments because it's, it's all that's available time-wise.
All right, final kind of 15 seconds, plug in a quick question if you have it. Otherwise, I will stop the video. I'll send everybody the recording. Thank you all for the great questions, for being great listeners. I'm happy that, that you found it beneficial. All right, enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Have a great weekend and then keep following the newsletters. You'll hear from me soon. My next one is gonna be on, on uh, looking at movement patterns from a diagnosis standpoint. So thank you for that feedback, Kalana. Kulana, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, appreciate it. You are so welcome, everybody. Have a great Saturday and I'll see you on the next one.